Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's lecture. Um, I'm very glad that we decided to host this event in this lecture theatre and not the college lecture theatre, although I'm sure our speaker could fill just about any venue. Um, welcome to Green Templeton College's annual lecture series. Um, the series this year has been on the subject of philanthropy and is typical of the sort of subject that the college can approach. We look at real-world problems, we look at interdisciplinary thinking, and we look with a very international perspective. The two previous lectures in the series by Josh Yates from Duke University and the Thriving Cities Network looked at the potential for philanthropy to be used as risk capital to prime potentially larger scale funding through impact investment and later capital or commercial financing, especially driving development in low to medium income countries. And Anne Birgitta Albrechtson, AB to her friends, former CEO of the Lego Foundation, now CEO of ABA Global Action, talked about establishing that philanthropy is a necessary collaborative process and that stakeholders need to coalesce around the evidence for what works. So a, a great platform, I think, for tonight's speakers to expand on, given his very varied personal journey with philanthropy. Um, I'm delighted and honoured to have him give the less, last lecture in this important series. Uh, and in a moment, our associate fellow, Caroline Greenhouse, will formally introduce him. After Rory's speech, he has generously agreed to a Q&A session, which will be chaired by Carolyn and uh, Ranjit Majumdar, who's a strategic consultant to the college. And finally, after the Q&A se uh, session, student rapporteur Pallavi Manon will offer a vote of thanks before the event closes. So thank you for coming tonight. Um, thank you, all of you online, for turning on your computers and joining us. And now over to Caroline for tonight's formal introduction of our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final lecture in our series, which is examining evidence-based philanthropy. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, the Right Honourable Rory Stewart. Rory Stewart is known to many, if not to all of us, as the co-host, together with Alistair Campbell, of two enormously popular, insightful and thought-provoking podcasts, The Rest is Politics and Leading, which have captivated audiences worldwide and garnered downloads of one million plus per episode. Rory's ability to communicate complex ideas with clarity, empathy and humour have earned him a devoted following and made him a trusted voice in the, public, in the realm of public discourse. Those of you familiar with the podcast will be aware of the many demands on Rory's time and his incredibly hectic travel schedule. In just this last week, Rory was in Japan for the G7 summit and then flew in this morning from Madrid. So we really do appreciate you making the time to give this keynote address. Rory's career has spanned both the political and intellectual arenas. After graduating from Oxford, he initially joined the army before joining the Foreign Office, where he served as a UK diplomat in Indonesia, the Balkans and Iraq. In 2005, he founded and led the Turquoise Mountain Foundation in Afghanistan before, joining the, before moving to Harvard University where he was appointed as Professor of Human Rights and Director of the Carr Center of Human Rights at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. In 2010, Rory was elected as Parliament for Penrith and the Borders. During his tenure, he held ministerial positions in four government departments ahead of his appointment as Secretary of State for International Development in 2019. Subsequently, he served as the Jackson Senior Fellow at the Yale Jackson School of Global Affairs. 
Rory is renowned for his captivating speeches, delivered without rancor and frequently without notes. Notably, he once gave a detailed and impassioned speech to the Commons about hedgehogs. In a speech beginning in Latin, Rory wove together references to Aristotle and Shakespeare to highlight the unsuitability of the hedgehog to be Britain's national symbol because of its tendency to roll up in a ball when confronted by danger and to sleep for half the year. <laughs> Deputy Speaker Eleanor Lang described it as one of the best speeches she had ever heard in the chamber. Rory has also gained acclaim as the best-selling author and a renowned adventurer. One of his remarkable exploits was his solo journey across Afghanistan on foot in 2002, which he vividly documented in his book, The Places in Between. Given his impressive linguistic abilities encompassing 11 languages, it's no wonder that rumours continue to persist that Rory might have served as an officer in MI6. Throughout his life, Rory has shown a desire to understand the complexities of our world and for evidence to inform our actions. Last year, Rory was appointed to be president of Give Directly, a non-profit that lets donors send money directly to the world's poorest households. Give Directly believe that people living in poverty deserve the dignity to choose for themselves how best to improve their lives. And money enables that choice. Give Directly collaborates with leading researchers to measure the impacts of cash transfers. They adhere to rigorous research protocols and place great emphasis on accountability, maintaining the utmost transparency in sharing their results. There can be no better qualified person, I'm sure you will all agree, to deliver this keynote lecture of our series. Rory's unique perspective has been shaped by a wealth of experiences and he will undoubtedly challenge and inspire us to think critically about how we can leverage evidence to maximise the impact of our philanthropic efforts. Please do join me in welcoming the Right Honourable Rory Stewart. Um, thank you all very much. Can you hear me clearly? Uh, fantastic. Um, it's a great honour to be here. And um, I have, as you've just heard, come from Japan. So I think it's about 5 o'clock in the morning. So if I, I fall over at some point, uh, my, that's what's happened. Um, I wanted to make this more of a conversation than my pontificating. But I was going to begin by framing a problem. And the problem is the struggle to end extreme poverty in the world. Ending extreme poverty is the first goal of the Sustainable Development Goals. And it is a goal that seemed very much within reach when those goals were drafted. In fact, it felt through much of the 1990s and 2000s as though poverty would almost disappear of its own accord. Huge international institutions the Department for International Development in the United Kingdom, for example, which when I was lucky enough to be Secretary of State, had a budget of about $20 billion a year, $20 billion a year, was set up in order to achieve this objective. But the absolute number of people living in extreme poverty in Africa was 170 million people in 1980 and it is 470 million people today. Today, over 700 million people worldwide live under $2.15 a day. And this strange number produced by the World Bank basically reflects people who do not have enough money to meet their most basic needs. To describe somebody who I just saw on the Rwanda-Burundi border, Classic example, she is living in a mud house. She has nothing in her house except for a single cooking pot. She is looking after three grandchildren because her daughter is working in town as a maid and her daughter is sending back $6 a month to her mother. Her mother owns no land, doesn't own the house that she's in. Her house has a grass roof which is leaking. She has no latrine. 
and her children, her grandchildren, are not in school because although theoretically education is free, you do need a little money to access education at all. The question I suppose that I want to pose is how is this possible? The poverty gap defined by the Brookings Institution, the theoretical amount of money that it would take to lift everybody in the world above $2.15 a day is $100 billion. That is, that is 0.1% of global GDP. 0.1% of global GDP. Now, that doesn't mean that you could do it for $100 billion. It might be a bit more. In fact, it almost certainly would be a bit more and be a bit more complicated than that. But it gives you some sense of the scale of the discrepancy between global wealth and that need. So what has happened? 1980s, as you remember, we were going to make poverty history. People will remember Live Aid. I remember Comic Relief, extraordinary concerts. They will remember G8 and G20 meetings committing to end extreme poverty. And I'm going to quickly talk us through that period from the late 1980s to today to suggest that underlying part of the problem, an underlying part of the problem of matching philanthropy with extreme poverty, in other words, doing something to help address the problem of extreme poverty is actually a problem of political change, of the collapse of a global liberal order. So here's my global liberal order story. And I want you to think about four distinct phases. 1989 to the early 2000s. This is the great age of liberal optimism. This, of course, is the age where the fall of the Berlin Wall brings the United States into a position of unrivaled dominance. This is the period in which every year the world becomes more prosperous. The number of democracies in the world during that period doubles. At its extraordinary period, from 88 onwards, democracies explode, not just in Central and Eastern Europe, but in Latin America, in Asia, and in Africa. Every year during that period, the number of civilians killed in conflict diminishes, the number of refugees diminish, the number of internally displaced people diminish. <coughs> this is the period of the humanitarian interventions in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in Bosnia, and in Kosovo, in which it seems possible to take a Western model of democracy, human rights, and free markets, and export them to other countries. This, of course, is the period where Francis Fukuyama writes his famous book about the end of history. And this is a period where poverty is dropping so dramatically that we are going to meet the Millennium Development Goal of halving extreme poverty years ahead of the date target, driven largely by an extraordinary transformation in China that is lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But in other places too, classic basket cases like Bangladesh are going through extraordinary transformations in this period. And then something begins to change. And the change begins to happen in about 2004. So the next period I want you to think about, which is the age of uncertainty and transition, is the decade from 2004 to 2014. During this period, the curve of rising democracies begins to flatten out, ceases to increase. There is an increasing constriction around the world of civil society. There is a sense that the human rights agenda is beginning to move backwards. This is, of course, a period of explosion of the power of China. China joins the World Trade Organization in 2001. 2005, China becomes larger than the French economy. 2006, it becomes larger than the British economy. 2007, it becomes larger than the German economy. 2008, it becomes larger than the Japanese economy. Put in context how quickly these things have happened. The British economy was larger than the Chinese economy in 2005. The Chinese economy is now approximately seven times larger than our own. 
It's happened very, very quickly. <laughs> this, however, is a period which I think is defined by three other things in addition to the rise of China. And don't, don't underestimate the rise of China because the rise of China is important because it represents a country doing astonishingly well in poverty alleviation, doing astonishingly well in growth, creating an enormous middle class, but doing so without becoming a democracy. And this is a fundamental shock, a fundamental shock to the US and its allies. In fact, academics, as you'll be aware, in the 1950s and 60s, modernization theorists believed that there was a natural relationship between economic growth and democracy, and that once you reached a critical level of growth, once your middle class was at a certain size, you could not fail uh, to become free and democratic. And that did not happen in China. But I think three other factors become important here. One of them is the rise of social media. So this period, in 2004, is the emergence of Twitter and Facebook. And by 2011, we see in the Arab Spring the extraordinary consequences of this new form of political communication, which allows a man who immolates himself, sets himself alight in Tunisia, to spark a revolution that stretches to Syria, to Bahrain, and to Yemen. A technology that begins to deepen polarization, deepen forces of hyperactive nationalism, conspiracy theory, and isolationism. But this is exacerbated by two other factors. Central to our story is, during this period, the humiliation of the United States and its allies in Iraq and Afghanistan. Why is that important? Well, it's important, of course, in terms of attacking the international legitimacy of the United States. But it's important for two other things as well. These are the most extravagant projects of nation building ever conceived in the world. On the ground in Afghanistan are not just 100,000 troops. There are over 100,000 international consultants. Over 100,000 international consultants. And working in charities, working in governments, working in other forms of supportive civilian activity, and they are attempting to transform the state. And they are drawing, as best they can, on all the academic learning and lessons which can be produced by American think tanks and universities in an attempt to try to fix the failed state. In fact, Afghanistan ends up having as its president a man who worked at the World Bank and then at Sice John Hopkins called Ashraf Ghani, who in fact wrote a book called Fixing Failed States. This is the man who eventually got on his helicopter and ran away when the Taliban came raging into Kabul. Three and a half trillion dollars, three and a half trillion dollars were spent in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, interestingly, that is almost exactly the same amount that China spent on its Belt and Road Initiative almost exactly the same amount that China spent building its extraordinary range of infrastructure, ports and roads, and creating its connections right the way across the landmass of Asia into Africa. But the other reason, of course, that it matters is that this is the cracking of a fundamental sense of a liberal global order. This is the moment at which the liberal order, which has been dominant in the 1990s, is exposed in many people's eyes as illegitimate, ignorant, and powerless. And then the final move in this period is the 2008 financial crisis. And the 2008 financial crisis, of course, breaks, particularly for Americans and Europeans, our fundamental confidence in the other plank of that story of the 1990s, which is our confidence in the capitalist market system. This then propels us in 2014 into our next age, what I want to call the age of populism. Age of populism, starting in 2014, this is the moment at which we see Narendra Modi elected in India. It's the moment at which we see ISIS take Mosul. And as we move forward, these are the years in which the Law and Justice Party is elected in Poland. This is the moment in 2014 when Erdogan decisively turns from being a pro-European, 
gay rights endorsing, anti-death penalty leader into somebody spending $400 million on his presidential palace. This, of course, is the era of the Brexit vote. This is the era in which eventually in Latin America, towards the end of this period, we see the election of people like Bolsonaro, but not just Bolsonaro. We see similar things eventually happening in Chile, uh, in Peru. And in all these cases, we see the central figure of this whole period, which is, of course, Donald Trump. Right? And it was in this period that I first became a development minister <laughs> and first began engaging with the question of addressing extreme poverty. And it was already clear to me then, when I first entered DFID, that we were in a very, very difficult world that international development had not yet acknowledged. In essence, it was already clear that political forces across the West were becoming more inherently isolationist, less committed to the idea of a global international order. And I think some of the reasons for that are in my previous age. Some of the reasons for that are, I mean, if I re go through those things again, I think the global financial crisis left people feeling poorer, made populations more conscious in wealthy countries of the fact that incomes had frozen, inequality was steep, and although wealthy people were getting wealthier, very little of that seemed to be getting into the hands of ordinary people. I think the humiliations of Iraq and Afghanistan accelerated the sense that these places are none of our business on the part of the right and on the part of the populist left that we are so guilty, we're so wrecked with anxiety about our relationships with these places going all the way back to our colonial history that maybe we shouldn't be doing anything there in the first place because we might just create more harm than good, whatever we try to do. Right? And you can see the application of the other elements that lead to this. So DFID responds, the Department for International Development responds with an ever more austere, narrow vision of what international development is going to be. Remains very committed to an arbitrary target. It's going to spend 0.7% of GDP on international aid. Now, this number, 0.7%, is actually a number dreamt up as 1% by economists in the late 1960s who believed in the late 1960s that if every developed country spent 1% of its budget on international development, this would generate 5% growth in the developing world. Right? Nobody by 2016 believed that anymore. In any way, the 1% had been dropped to 0.7%, uh, and the theory was extraordinarily out of date. Nevertheless, the commitment to this number remained absolute. And there was a real reluctance from the department to actually engage with the public, to really think about how the British public might be able to reconcile itself to international development. Many of the programs involved huge transfers of money to largely anonymous multilateral institutions, the World Bank, the UN, which it was very, very difficult to communicate the impacts of the British gift. And Ultimately, the result of this was an extremely unscrupulous figure, Boris Johnson, uh, managed to get himself elected as prime minister and to exploit the extraordinary opportunities available to him of cutting the international development budget, moving the money, a lot of the money from the international development budget into other things that he wanted to do, breaking the international development assistance law and doing it, merging the Department of International Development with the Foreign Office, and ultimately ending up in a situation where the $4 billion odd in bilateral aid, which I was spending in Africa in 2018, is now probably, although the government is hiding the figures, about a billion dollars of bilateral aid. We've largely cut by 75% because, in fact, much of the money has been diverted to paying for Ukrainian refugees here in Britain, and a lot of the other money is, is going to middle-income countries now. What does this mean? Right. What, what does this funny story about the change in the world and my time in DFID really mean for international philanthropy and poverty? Well, what it means is that we are in an unpropitious time for government giving. 
The story of Britain, unfortunately, is not unique. Sweden has also cut its international development budget. Norway is also cutting its international development budget. In fact, most of the key actors are increasingly putting money into Ukraine and Ukrainian refugees at the expense of Sub-Saharan Africa. In the crisis in the Horn of Africa at the moment, the drought crisis in the Horn of Africa, over 90% of the money is now coming from the United States alone because the other traditional donors have left the scene. This puts an increasing emphasis on philanthropists, and particularly puts an increasing emphasis on American philanthropists because it is from America that most of the really big money is going into international development. Part of these moves, part of the uncertainty within our own populations may be driven by financial crisis, may be driven by cost of living, may be driven by frozen living standards, may be driven by a sense of increasing doubt and despair about our role in the world, it means that if you look at the graph of giving on Red Nose Day, uh, it is absolutely astonishing. It shoots up during our period from 30 million to about 110 million and has now dropped down to 30 million again. Uh, the membership of Oxfam, the number of people who are sending regular payments to Oxfam, has also dropped very, very dramatically during this period. It is increasingly difficult to sign up ordinary members of the public. Uh, if any of you step outside a tube in London, you'll see somebody standing there probably in a bib, or you used to see someone standing in a bib, trying to sign you up to give money to an NGO. You don't see so many of them anymore. Uh, because it is almost impossible to sign someone up. Recent research by these NGOs have concluded that it costs about £700 to sign up a single donor. And you can only make the money back over three years. It takes you three years to make back the cost of acquisition, the cost of paying those people to stand outside the tube stations to get the money in. Now, in America, it seemed as though we were in an extraordinary situation, and that extraordinary situation was largely driven by the tech boom. Extraordinary generosity of Bill Gates, who made incredible progress in global health. We've seen Jeff Bezos set up his Earth Fund. We've seen Jeff Bezos's um, former wife uh, be incredibly generous in terms of her donations to many different causes. She's been giving individual gifts of $50, $100 million. However, that source of funds has been hit quite hard by the retrenchment in tech stops, uh, the collapse, for example, of crypto, which was another source of a great deal of money. And altogether, nonprofits engaged in Africa are facing a challenge. What's the answer to this challenge? Well, one answer I want to propose <laughs> to addressing extreme poverty is to think much more seriously about three big revolutions in understanding, which put us in a different position from the position we were in in the 1990s, and which might give us more hope than we had in the 1990s, because part of this story is a story of loss of hope at some level the reason why individuals are not giving money to nonprofits to Africa is they don't believe it's going to do any good. And some of the reason politicians are no longer prepared to endorse their governments giving money is they don't think it's going to do any good. And the fundamental feeling is we've been giving money for a long time and it hasn't made much difference. Okay? And the places where there have been huge transformations are places like China where we can't take much credit for it. Right? We don't feel we can take much credit for it. So what are those three things? Number one. The development of mobile money in Africa. So M-Pesa, which is a platform that allows, and its variants in other African countries, that allows money to be directly transferred onto the phone, and it can be a feature phone, costing $8, not a fancy phone like this, to anybody in a village, and allows them to have the money directly on their phone without the money having to pass through governments, middle people with all the risks of corruption diversion along the way also allowing a very direct connection between the giver and the recipient. So you could sign up to support someone and your money could go directly to their phone. Second transformation, randomized control tests. So 
an explosion of medical style tests have taken place in international development, which many of you will be familiar with, where in essence you set up a control group and a treatment group, and then you measure over time the impact of your intervention on a randomly selected control group and treatment group. This is revolutionary because all of us in this room will remember the normal claims that were made by charities before randomized control tests existed, which is you've given your money and three years later, here is this amazing girl who's at university. Right. But it's completely impossible in the normal case to be certain that your intervention is what made the difference. Your intervention is actually what caused her going to university. The great thing about the randomized control test is you can, for example, give cash to 10,000 people in Uganda, not give cash to 10,000 people in Uganda, make sure that they have been statistically selected to be representative, follow them over three, six, nine, 12 years, and be relatively confident that if there are differences between the groups, it's the cash that made the difference rather than something else. Right. The third thing I think which has changed is an understanding of the fact that of the many things that we want to do in international development, not all of them are within our control. At the heart of Ashraf Ghani's book, Fixing Failed States, is the idea that it is possible to fix someone else's failed state. Before he went back to Afghanistan, he went to Nepal to tell them how to fix their failed state. He went to South Sudan to tell them how to fix their failed state. The idea was that there was a recipe that could be exported. In essence, those theories were defining a problem and in their definition of the problem, implying that they had the solution. So they were absolutely correct that the problems in many of these countries were poor governance, corruption, uh, a business elite and a government that had no real commitment to development. They were absolutely right that in many of these contexts, uh, what was lacking was a vibrant civil society. Uh, that what was lacking um, was 15 other things. Right? But the truth of the matter is increasingly poverty is located in fragile and conflict affected states or in states with incredibly poorly functioning governmental systems and where you cannot remotely convince yourself that you have an elite committed to development. The revolution in understanding is the understanding that it is possible in those contexts to differentiate what you can do from what you can't do. That in those contexts, it may not be possible. Right. There are many, many, many problems with this, but one of the fundamental problems with getting across this idea and I'm going to return to this idea at the end of this little speech of why cash delivered to phones can be an extraordinary thing to give us hope and inspiration and be a central part of our commitment to ending extreme poverty globally. But it's important to understand that there are real barriers to taking this on. Some of them are psychological. Uh, some of them are historical. Some of them are institutional. Psychological. Philanthropic donors don't like just giving money. They want to give their brains. I cannot tell you the number of times I have sat with philanthropic donors where they say, I don't just want to give my money, I want to give my advice. Right. Ideally, they want to be able to tell their friends they've come up with a really cunning plan to do something that nobody else has ever thought of, generally involving technology. So they don't want to sit at a dinner party and say, I uh, when their friend says, what are you doing to help the poor in Africa? I'm giving them cash. Their friend will just be like, what's wrong with you? I have invented an amazing seesaw, which when children sit on it, also acts as a water pump, right? <laughs> uh, Bill Gates actually um, uh, had a moment of this. He, he had a moment where he suddenly decided that the one thing that nobody, the one big thing that nobody had noticed is that chickens, wait for it, have eggs, right? <laughs> so he began shipping large numbers of chickens to countries. Uh, and when governments in Sahel said, what's happening here? Uh, he said, well, what you don't understand, you see, is that this chicken 
is gonna have an egg. And the egg is gonna have a chicken. And so if you keep going have more and more chickens, right? And you can actually see videos on the web of this. Um, uh, now, uh, I, I don't really need to tell this audience why it might be the case that a farmer in Senegal might know a little bit more about the pros and cons of keeping a chicken than Bill Gates, but we'll, we'll leave that side to the side. Um, so there's a vanity problem. The second problem is a sort of historical proverb problem. We are all told uh, that if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, teach him to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. Right? And cash feels like a giant fish-giving project. Um, the problem, though, with the idea that you need to teach a man to fish uh, is that, in many cases, they already know how to fish. Right? Or they don't want to be a fisherman. They want to open a tailoring shop. And it and sounds like I'm being funny here, but I'm not being funny, because actually the fundamental developmental model across much of the world is this thing called capacity building. And the idea of capacity building is that the villager lacks capacity. And that what you've really got to do is turn up and give them capacity, and then everything will be fine. And there are many, many problems with that. I mean, there's the problem that they might already have that capacity. But there's the other problem that the needs of each individual within each individual house is quite distinct. And these programs are generally one size fits all. Generally, you're teaching them all to do the same thing. I mean, almost regardless of their individual needs, their individual skills. But the other problem is that in order to make use of their capacity, they often need capital. I cannot tell you the number of times I go and meet villagers who say, I had a wonderful NGO who turned up in my village and they told me all about what fertilizers and seeds I need. And I said, so have you been using them? And they say, no, because they spent all the money on the capacity building and I couldn't buy any fertilizer and seed. Or I was told that I needed to have more calcium in my diet, but I didn't have any money to buy a cow, so I can't get any milk. Right? In fact, we found in benchmark studies comparing cash against nutrition programs that cash at a certain scale was able to transform nutritional outcomes, transform bone density and stunting, basically, because the fundamental problem facing the villagers was not lack of knowledge, it was lack of money to get food. It is quite straightforward. In fact, this basic insight that a lot of the, ooh, how did I do that? Um, <laughs> basic insight that a lot of the things which are holding people back is simply poverty, that poverty underlies the other issues, is fundamental. You know, it's very easy to think, don't give people cash. Instead, what you need to do is be providing them with contraceptives, or providing them with health care, or giving them nutrition. But often what is holding them back from those things is simply the cash. The cash is preventing them getting to the clinic. The cash is preventing them getting their school, their kids into school. The cash is actually, the lack of cash is what's leading them to have many more children the cash is what's preventing them from accessing nutrition. Right? And it's a, it's a lesson that we understand in Britain. You know, that the fundamental determining factor for a whole series of life outcomes is simply poverty. And addressing poverty is an extraordinary help in addressing those other forms of life outcomes. What's the final problem? Institutional. The institutional problem is that we're all employed as specialists in a lot of these NGOs and development agencies to be specialists in agriculture or nutrition or health. And it does us all out of a job, right? If what you end up doing is simply transferring cash to somebody at the end of the world. But why, to conclude, should we do this? Well, why should we do this? We should do this, firstly, and I think quite fundamentally, because direct cash transfers to the extreme poor addresses many of the questions of this 40-year story that I've told. This 40-year story is, in essence, a story of overweening ambition. It's a story of hubris. It's a story of arrogance. It's a story of our failure to impose our models on other people. Giving cash, by contrast, is radically respectful. In fact, it's much more respectful than doing community consultations or surveys. Instead of asking people what they want and then giving them what you want, you are literally giving them the cash and letting them do what they want unconditionally. 
By doing so, you are giving them dignity. You're not just giving them dignity, you are, to use the jargon, empowering them. But by empowering them, they will display more dignity. And through that increased dignity, our empathy for them will also increase. There's a wonderful virtuous circle there. The difference to that. In fact, we can almost certainly end global poverty in our lifetime. And doing that is not just an act of logic or self-interest. It is an act of immense ethical significance because it is an act of empathy, of respect, of acknowledgement of dignity, of acknowledgement of fundamental equality, and in the process of our action, an acknowledgement of our own solidarity, our own sense of community, our sense of compassion. Thank you very much indeed. Questions, thoughts? Uh, yes. Start, gentleman, there, and then I'm going to walk, move down. Yep, that, that's you. Yep, yep. yep. Um, wait for a, wait for a microphone. microphone. Oh, because it's being um, put on the web. We need a microphone for your voice. Thank you for that. That was um, that was wonderful. Um, I've worked in uh, Africa since 2006. I started working with Médecins Sans Frontières and. Um, Somalia uh, around that time and Angola. Um, I've since worked in global health research here for a good period after that and there's been wonderful changes, huge development and growth in the sector and um, improvement in the types of facilities I've seen in that time. But I am singularly wholly petrified by climate change. Um, you've mentioned it there but almost in the pejorative of it, people being somehow obsessed with this or distracted by it. Um, and certainly in your voting record and that of the Tories, it's not been big on the agenda. And so I was hoping that you might speak to that because I know that you're personally very interested in it, but um, it hasn't been reflected in the policies of the governments you've served. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, it's a good challenge. I think, um, well, f firstly, when I came into DFID as the Secretary of State, the first thing I did was to double our spending on climate and the environment. And that was a very controversial decision. And it's one that I still struggle with today. So the permanent secretary in the department, or the acting permanent secretary at the time, uh, said to me, I shouldn't be doing this. That in effect, I'm taking money away from the extreme poor to invest in climate and the environment. So at the time, I argued that in fact, climate change was going to increase the number of extreme poor, going to add another 100, 150 million people in extreme poverty, and that we shouldn't be separating these issues. I think it is an existential crisis, but I also think, unfortunately, it has become a brutal zero-sum game in terms of poverty, because increasing amounts of money from the major multilateral institutions are now going to middle-income countries. The focus is on trying to reduce emissions in China, or Indonesia, and Somalia, where people are suffering the consequences of climate change. We're in the fourth year, maybe even the seventh year of drought, depending on how you measure it. We have, we've got millions of people on the edge of starvation, is not emitting anything. And therefore, because it's not contributing to climate change, the Bezos Earth Fund is not putting any money into it. The $100 billion a year that we're supposed to be raising, none of that money is going to be going towards it. Um, so. It, it is very, very striking that the concern with climate change has become increasingly what my permanent secretary was, was predicting, which was the taking away of money from countries in extreme poverty and the diversion of that money to other places. Now, the argument made is that if we don't do this, the world's going to end. But the implicit assumption of that, and this is you know, what, what the acting permanent secretary said, is that we're going to let the poor of today suffer for the sake of saving the poor of tomorrow. And that's a very, very difficult ethical calculus. So I guess I think there are hugely important things. 
Climate change is hugely important. Global health is hugely important. But I also get frustrated with the global health. I'm frustrated with the fact that Bill Gates only wants to think about vaccination. And he doesn't want to think about giving cash to people and actually improving their lives. And I think there is a sense in which it's great, yeah, infant mortality has been transformed, life expectancy has been transformed. All these things are wonderful, but increasingly it means people are living longer lives of utter destitution. Um, so I, I don't know what to do about this. I think these are all good ethical programs. But unfortunately, in reality, those two ethical programs have taken more and more money away from the project of addressing poverty. Oh, sorry, I said the lady there next. I'm sorry. I, there, um, uh, uh, a microphone. I'll give shorter answers to let people come in. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, could you bring a microphone to the lady in blue, please? Uh, two more steps down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you so much. Um, I'm interested to hear your point of view with the emergence of direct giving. What do you think that will mean for NGOs? Do you think it will be a sector that will reduce in size? What will the impact be? Well, I, I don't know. I think, um, I mean, there are a number of problems, of course, with direct giving. So what, one of them is that it's not that appealing to a lot of people. A lot of people don't, don't like the idea of just giving cash. They want to build a school or build a well or don't want to just give someone cash. And, and that's partly because it's very difficult um, conveying how transformatory cash can be in an individual's life. So it's not until you can actually get to the village, see the person, see how the money has changed their lives, see the freedom and the dignity it's given them, that you can really feel the excitement of giving somebody cash instead of contributing to a school. I think it's important, I mean, this is one thing I'm struggling to communicate, that we, that cash sounds to us dirty. It sounds to us like we're a sort of lazy godfather who, instead of buying a present for Christmas, has just sent an Amazon voucher, right? <laughs> um, but, but the point is not the cash. The point is what somebody does with the cash. The cash is, is freedom. The cash is capability. The cash is what allows them to make choices and improve their life. The cash is the school, the access to health care, the food, the roof on the house. Um, so I think that will continue to keep NGOs going because people are not making that transition. But I do think over time, yes, the number of people working in international development will decrease and for a series of reasons. And one of them is we will become more efficient. Another is I think we'll become more skeptical of the idea of highly paid foreigners. Um, now, it's very unfortunate. I mean, I, you know, I benefited from this. I, I was a highly paid foreigner working in international development, and I had an amazing time. Um, and you know, there are many, many young people leaving universities in Britain at the moment who want to go and work for NGOs, but the truth is that probably we're moving to a world where we will be using more and more locally engaged staff and fewer and fewer foreigners. Yeah. OK, uh, right, I'm going to take two questions together. <laughs> The lady in green and then lady in red. And I'll, I'll be, make my answers even shorter. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm Judith Cheatham, a former fellow of the college. Thank you very much. Totally convincing, brilliant analysis. You started in, the last, in your last um, answer to talk about one of the problems with direct giving. Are there any other problems? I don't want to sound like a miserable yeah. doubting Thomas. No, the, but many, the, uh, if many you're other totally problems. convincing, yeah, yeah. it's good to know what yeah. the difficulties yeah. are as well. Yeah. Thank you. There are many other problems. Yeah, and I'll, lady in red, and I'll answer the problems and then answer uh, this lady here. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts on kind of collecting evidence in the long term on how this cash is working, because you kind of talked about the heterogeneity in the outcomes and sort of how each person is using it as to what is best for them. So I guess, how do you know it's actually working? Okay, very good. All right, two, two very good questions. So what are, what are the problems with cash? Um, one of the problems with cash is that there are many things that, that unconditional individual cash transfers cannot provide. So an individual cash transfer can allow you to fix your house, buy a cow, set up a small business, get your children to school. What it cannot do is improve the quality of education in that school. So there are many public goods which are fundamentally the business of governments. 
and where giving small amounts of cash to individuals isn't going to change. I mean, if we think about our own society, um, we do, but equally, the government needs to invest in, in infrastructure. It's also true, not just schools and hospitals, but it needs roads and dams and electricity and this kind of stuff. You also need a government and an elite committed to development. I mean, this is a very strong point made by my dear friend, Stefan Durkon, who is sitting here in the front row, whose book you must all read on this subject. Um, but uh, Stefan is very, you know, a necessary condition for proper sustained growth is to have, for, for however you create it, a governing group that actually wants to develop their country rather than simply predate and steal from the country. And again, direct cash giving cannot do that. What cash giving can do is include the extreme poor in that development story. Because one of the sadnesses is Rwanda, for example, has had very, very significant growth over 30 years, 8% growth a year. But 37% of the population of Rwanda continue to live in extreme poverty. You know, 4 million people in Rwanda continue to live in extreme poverty. What the cash would give them is the opportunity to benefit from that infrastructure, from those schools, from those roads that have already been established. That's in the happy situation and in the bad situation, the sort of Liberia situation, cash is also what you can do when those things don't exist to provide things in the absence of those functioning government systems. Um, so I think it's a good bet in both contexts. But for real sustained economic growth, it's not sufficient. Necessary, but not sufficient. Or it's necessary for the inclusion of the extreme poor, but not sufficient. Yeah. yeah. OK, yes. Gentleman there, and then gentleman there, and then I'll promise to come to the side of the room. I'm aware that I'm neglecting that side of the room. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Federico, and I'm a student at the Black School of Government here at Oxford. Um, my country, El Salvador, six years ago was the murder capital of the world. Yes. And in the past 14 months, we suddenly become the safest country in America, mm -hmm. while also incarcerating 5% of the adult population. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but mind you, um, a few weeks ago, I took some of my classmates of Oxford down to El Salvador. It's the first time in my life that I've described violence in the past tense. Mm -hmm. People are out and about and free. Mm -hmm. And our president has a 92% approval rate mm -hmm. and is expected to run for re-election. Re um, so democracy, in a way, has elected the de-democratization. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we just hadn't seen. But if we observe China, we, we saw how authoritarianism also created a revolution that today is bearing fruit. Mm. So what is your opinion on these mm. type of movements? Mm. And how scared or optimistic should we be of something post-democracy and scribbling also an old authoritarianism? Mm. Uh, is, is there a possibility of birthing something new? OK, um, right. I'm going to, and gentleman in front, and I'll try to weave. Is it, you, yes, there we are. Gentleman with the red tie. Sorry, I'm, I keep ex describing people by their clothes, and you're behind them. So that doesn't help much. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a, a very remarkable address, and your, your concept is an extremely tempting and attractive and interesting one, and I like it a lot. Um, what worries me slightly uh, is a kind of inborn cynicism, or, or at least mild suspicion, that um, this thing is going to have to be sustained and continued. In other words, we're not talking about 600 quid per villager. We're talking about 600 quid per villager this year, and probably 650 or 700 next year. So we're actually looking at a much more convoluted commitment than, than perhaps mm. um, the way you have most attractively packaged it. Very good. Thank you. OK. Um, it's a very good challenge. Um, uh, it, it's true that there are basically two models here. There's a model where you give a sum of money every year, which is effectively setting up something like a welfare state, sort of social safety net, where the extreme poor continue to get money. But we are finding significant impacts from one-time payments, which are quite surprising. So in Uganda, using a randomized control test, $350 given 12 years ago, you can still see the difference between the control group and the treatment group 12 years later, because that sum of money appears to have been just enough to allow people to build up some assets, get a small business going. We've seen the same. Um, with programs run in Bangladesh by BRAC, their extreme poverty graduation programs. They combine the cash with quite a lot of support. But it is true that 
you see situations where people go from basically zero savings, zero income, from a single transfer to a situation where they are beginning to build up some savings and income because they have a productive asset. Now, it's not guaranteed. It doesn't work in the case of uh, the elderly and the disabled. It tends to be more effective if it's a young entrepreneurial person who's getting this money. But it is nevertheless quite striking that there is a number of people for whom a one-time transfer seems to have a sustained impact. Um, solving the question of El Salvador and China is, is uh, maybe you know, for a different, different thing. Um, but you know, to add to your analysis, it is also true that, of course, the development success stories in Africa recently have been places like Rwanda and Ethiopia, which have not exactly been uh, you know, American fantasy democracies. Whereas Malawi, which is a more democratic state, has received $17 billion in international aid in the last 15 years, and its poverty rate has not moved at all. Right? So there is a problem. And uh, making the argument for democracy has to become more textured and more nuanced. And I think we can no longer take it for granted in the way that we might have done 30 years ago. That we can assume, I mean, I, I got in trouble and I was in, in Madrid yesterday at a conference and I was attacked by two great veteran American diplomats who said that I was being too pessimistic about America's place in the global order. Um, they said, you know, everybody loves democracy, everybody loves freedom, you know, but the truth is, of course, there are many people in El Salvador who are actually quite happy with the situation and many people in China who are quite happy with the situation and that's an uncomfortable thing that we need to work our way through. So we need to articulate the value of democracy in more than instrumental terms. It cannot simply be as a delivery mechanism for prosperity or security. Those things can be delivered through authoritarian means. It must be more about liberty and what liberty and equality mean and why that's important for human soul. I'm going to finish uh, here because I'm aware that I'm running against time. Do we have a, we've got a tight time end, have we? Yes, we've tight time. Yeah, Thanks, Karen. We've got time for one more question. Okay, one more question. All right, so I'm going to quickly take that with my last question, I promise. Okay, who's, last question. Um, I haven't heard from enough women, so I'm going to go to somebody here. Yeah, there, that's you. That's you, yes. Wave your hand, I'm sorry. That's you, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I work in the refugee uh, sector with, in Uganda currently, and um, when we implement cash programming, one of the feedback we receive, especially from women and girls, is that cash programming can cause um, gender-based violence-related risks and harms. So I just wanted to ask, what's your opinion on that? What could be the solution to mitigate those risks? Yeah. So evidence on this is very interesting. Um, there have been studies that have suggested it increases gender-based uh, gender violence. In other words, that people are beating up their partner to get the money. There's also been strong evidence in the other direction that actually it leads to a significant reduction in gender-based violence because as the household becomes more prosperous, the stress and the tension around money in the household reduces and there's less violence. Um, so this is something that people are continuing to study all the time. 85% um, of the recipients of lump sum cash transfers in our programs at the moment are women. Generally, our feedback is that this actually leads to empowerment of women and more positive situations for women in the household. But we have to be very conscious of that. And one of the things that we try to do is work very closely with village chiefs, government, police, when a cash transfer is going in, or in the case of refugee camp, UNHCR, when a, a cash transfer occurs in order to prevent that happening. And I'd be very interested to hear more in Uganda because in fact, our cash transfer programs in Uganda have had extraordinary results in randomized control tests. Um, so I'd be interested to follow up on specifically that. Okay, measurement, which is what we're going to finish on. Um, measurement is surprisingly tricky because cash, of course, is multidimensional. Cash is, if you imagine a village as a sort of mountainous landscape, the extraordinary thing about cash is it flows in like water into that landscape, filling every gap and hollow, filling education for one, health for another, business for another. That, of course, does make it difficult to measure. We have traditionally measured it in terms of the effects on people's savings and their incomes and investment. Increasingly, we're trying to measure it in terms also of its impact on nutrition, education, enrollment. Then people will say, how about its impacts on gender-based violence? We're also looking at the impact on climate and the environment. So there's, you know, we've got a very interesting question about climate and the environment, but 
one of the things we're interested in is evidence that suggests that cash transfers done correctly can give somebody a incentive not to damage the surrounding ecosystem, for example, not to deforest or to engage in a more productive way with the natural landscape, or put less pressure on their, uh, uh, on their surrounding environment. But the question of measurement is complex because the more questions that you ask, the more difficult it becomes and the more time of the villages you're taking and you're having to return every three, six, nine years with enormous numbers of questions and people keep generating more and more questions and you have to keep tracking down your control group and your treatment group. Okay, thank you. Line to finish on. Um, look, we are in a moment of slight despair. We're in a moment of slight hopelessness. Um, and one of the reasons we're in a moment of despair and hopelessness is there are a lot of snake oil salesmen out there selling instant solutions to things. So please do not take away the idea that cash is the instant solution to everything. It isn't. Cash is a modest, humble, respectful, non-vain way of giving something to the extreme poor which they can put to immediate use. It is not going to solve all the problems of the world but it is going to make individual lives significantly better. And we're seeing multiplier effects where through production consumption, often making many, many more lives better than just the people that receives it because it's spilling over into surrounding markets. And it is something that we can do. And it's on this that I want to end, right? The tragedy of the last 40 years has often been that we've forgotten the lesson that ought implies can. We often felt that we had a moral obligation to do what we cannot do. Here we have a possibility of doing something which is practical, which is academically rigorous, and which is also profoundly ethical. And I would encourage you to follow that, but with some humility. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rory. I'd like to invite Pallavi to give the vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone. Thanks again to all of you for your attendance and engagement today. My name is Pallavi Menon, and I'm a current MSc student in the Evidence-Based Social Intervention and Policy Evaluation Program. Rory Stewart, thank you so much for your talk today. I honestly cannot believe that you got through the whole thing without a single note, entirely from memory. Your journey from working on state building and intervention to establishing a charity in Afghanistan, serving as Minister for International Development, and ultimately harnessing the power of cash transfers is truly inspiring. Your call for the world to rediscover a sense of hope, to combat isolationism, is a powerful and timely message. The remarkable possibilities that have emerged through research and technology, unthinkable just a decade earlier, gives us reason to believe that ending extreme poverty might actually be achievable within our lifetime. So that brings us to the end of our last lecture for this series, Seeing is Believing. Thank you to Sir Michael Dixon, Carolyn Greenhalsh, Ranjit Majumdar, to the GTC team for all your support, and again to Rory Stewart for your talk today. Thanks again to our audience here and to everyone who joined us online. Have a wonderful evening.